Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our third One Health seminar of the semester. We've got three more to go. Uh, for those of you who have not joined us before for a One Health seminar, let me tell you a little bit about One Health. Well, One Health is essentially just recognizing that uh, we're all in this together. We're all on this planet together and having to deal with uh, problems that really come at us from all kinds of different directions and have impacts that may be positive or negative, that people, animals, plants, the environment, we're all in this together and that we have uh, essentially, we're inextricably linked to each other. Uh, and the more that we understand that and that our actions impact the world around us and what's happening in the world also affects us. Uh, so this is a transdisciplinary systems approach that we're working towards. And here at DelVal, we're approaching this from basically three different sides. If I can get my slides to go ahead there. Uh, first of all, education. And so all of our students at DelVal are introduced to the One Health concept within their first year. Uh, and then we hope that many of the faculty members are also bringing forth a One Health concept in their disciplines. And the whole point is that no matter what your discipline, uh, you've got something to bring to the table and that we all should respect each other's disciplines and uh, be willing to work together to deal with the problems that we're faced on a regional, local, national, international, global levels. Uh, also to encourage research uh, and this seminar is part of our outreach. And so with the six seminars that we do each year or each semester, uh, it is our hope that we're uh, bringing some new information to students, but also some new information to our community and those who have a chance to, to watch these uh, in the future. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Tanya Casas, who will introduce our speaker today. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Reg. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Salau Roge. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, he's been on our campus um, several times. Um, the last time he was here, he was actually here as a visiting scholar. He was doing some research and um, he, he gave a talk as well to the campus community. So I'm really, really happy to see him. And as uh, as Mr. Hoyt said, um, you know, we're all in this together. We're all in this, you know, in, in the world together, um, addressing issues. And uh, Dr. Salau Rogek is here from Kenya. So that's very exciting. Um, he holds a doctorate in anthropology from Carleton University um, in Canada and a master's degree in environmental science and climate change from the University of Nairobi. He has worked with community-based development organizations, particularly within the Maasai community. Dr. Roge, Roge's work focuses on the intersections between culture and modernity, indigenous knowledge and conservation and sustainable well-being, um, Enkishon. Dr. Salau uh, Roge is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Carleton University, where his research focuses on resource conflicts among the pastoralist communities in East Africa, and he is also a freelance researcher and consultant working with indigenous communities on issues related to development, climate change, environment, and social economic empowerment. So thank you very much. Um, and I really look forward to your talk. Thank you. So um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Tanya, for having me. Uh, here. Um, it's a privilege to join you again, uh, albeit virtually. Uh, I've been uh, in your beautiful campus physically, uh, but uh, we wish thus that kind of freedom is going to resume soon. And uh, today I'm happy to be a panelist uh, sharing and contributing to what's the One Health uh, series of seminars which is really something that is, I'm passionate about because I'm passionate about sustainability. I'm passionate about uh, everybody's uh, recognizing the fact that uh, we all share the responsibility of making our, 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 our universe as habitable as possible and uh, you know, 
the, providing the stewardship, stewardship towards the future generations. And uh, I'm going to make uh, my presentation, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, let me see. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, perfect. perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll be talking about uh, mediating Mandeleo. It's my topic. And Mandeleo is a generic uh, term. It's a Swahili name. Swahili is one of the languages spoken in East Africa. It's actually a national language in Kenya uh, and Tanzania and some other East African countries. And so Mandeleo is a um, it's a Swahili word, but kind of borrowed and integrated into um, the mainstream language of development. So basically uh, translates to development. And uh, uh, I think it has been uh, uh, kind of uh, domesticating the term development from as a colonial relic, as we know, you know, the colonial, the coloniality of of, of modernity and development and making the, 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 the indigenous peoples and the native Africans to uh, uh, follow the development route that the predecessor colonial uh, masters were showing them. And so after independence, Mandeleo as a term has developed over time to basically mean moving forward or, 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 or developing us, so to speak. And so my, this, this, this topic is emanating from my um, doctoral research. Uh, this is that uh, I did a few years ago and defended early in the year. <clears throat> and uh, I, I was looking at development because that, is, that has been my, my area. My background is um, in anthropology as it has been introduced, but um, quite interested in cross-cutting issues such as environmentality and development. And so I was focusing on development matters. My research, I carried my research in, in, uh, in the Rift Valley, in the southern part of Kenya. And uh, so I'll be discussing today about how to go about mediating that uh, sort of development and trying to construct a nexus. But I'm doing this from the Maasai perspective. And I have borrowed from the Maasai philosophy uh, of action, which basically means uh, stewardship or the well being of the, of, of the communities and generations and uh, the, 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 the interconnectivity of well-being between human, human beings, the natural environment, the, 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 the gone generations, the coming generations. So it's a really <clears throat> a web of connection of, of values. And uh, so I've borrowed from that as a philosophy to look at, um, uh, to, look, to, to, to look through the lenses of the master and using their, their philosophy, their wisdom, in, uh, in trying to uh, mediate or even understand, to get deep understanding of, of Mandeleo. And uh, <clears throat> um, I, I did, at the end of this, I intend to have uh, uh, shared with you and uh, know, because I took geothermal development as uh, my focus area uh, in, the, in the particular site where I was doing my research. Uh, and uh, Geothermal was an, is, a, is an interesting project. One, it is one of the fast growing development activities in the country, one of the mega development projects in Kenya, being driven by, of course, the global warming question. So it is coming as a solution to the global warming uh, phenomena and, and eventually addressing climate change issues. And so uh, it's coming up quite uh, strongly, of course, driven by international resources. Uh, backing it up and a lot of uh, political goodwill in the country. And so these developments are taking place and are happening in uh, uh, the as well um, kind of marginal areas, you know, the areas that were the frontier regions of the country, the semi-arid areas occupied by indigenous peoples. And so I took, I started, I rather undertook my research among the Maasai indigenous communities uh, in Southern Kenya and uh, and uh, and trying to look at geothermal development as a case study and how this is impacting on one the community uh, livelihoods and two the environment basically especially the biodiversity 
because as we know, the indigenous peoples and biodiversity are really interconnected and their natural environment. But this, in this particular area, geothermal development is actually taking place in a protected area, in a national park. So it was uh, an interesting uh, case study. So I, I try to look at uh, then the deeper meaning of this mind, the layer of development as we come to understand it, and uh, then ask ourselves the question, so, for who, for, you know, this development is being driven for who, for whose benefit, and by who, and, and why. But also try to understand uh, how the Maasai perceive it. And to do that, as I said earlier, I use the English philosophy to try and, and uh, not only understand, but how the Maasai also can, or how the English philosophy can be used to mediate uh, these contested developments and the frictions, uh, so to speak. Uh, but also, uh, finally, try to have been my, this particular uh, study have tried attempted to construct an access between these overlaps of development, of conservation, of community well-being, because at the end of the day, it, it, each of them is important. Uh, none of them is important than the other, but then they all need to accommodate each other. Um, but just before I go, uh, you know, a little bit uh, deeper, perhaps I should. Uh, just uh, mention a little bit about the Maasai. These are Nilotic ethnic groups um, uh, inhabiting northern central, southern Kenya, and northern Tanzania. Uh, the, 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 the communities, I guess, is really uh, well known uh, in many countries and actually in the world because of their distinctive customs. And they have managed to maintain these customs uh, in spite of uh, uh, modernity and also in. in, in in spite of a lot of change that is taking place around them. Uh, so um, for that reason, they have uh, stood out uh, as a, a very distinct uh, society in the region. Uh, but also, they're also known as livestock keepers, uh, pastoralists, living livestock and moving from one place to another, practicing nomadism, a seasonal transhumans movement, uh, using the, uh, the forage and the natural resources within the, uh, the territories where they live. Um, <clears throat> but then for Mandeleo, and especially for the area where I was doing my study, um, of course we see uh, from those uh, photos, like this is really a very marginal area, but a lot of uh, development is taking place because in this area, it's in the Rift Valley, and so we have this uh, geothermal uh, resource beneath the service, and uh, the government has been keen on tapping this resource and of course, uh, uh, driving its development agenda nationally, but also addressing the, the national, international concern of, of climate change. And so it has got international and national uh, political goodwill, so to speak, and a lot of financial support. And so this is happening in the, in the, in the in community areas occupied by people, occupied by wildlife. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of of huge mega development projects taking place, other movers, fencing taking place, a standard gauge railway, a railway line being constructed, evacuation lines, as you see on that photo on the bottom part of the screen on my right, um, uh, the, the evacuation lights for the power and uh, the far background, you could see the smoke billowing from the hills. And, uh, and so basically this will be, be interpreted uh, locally and nationally as real development, Mindeleo, so to speak. And politicians are very proud of saying how much Mindeleo they are doing for the community. So this is the region, um, that's the Rift Valley. You can see it's dotted with, with the, potentially with, with a lot of uh, uh, areas uh, marked with, with red and stars um, where this geothermal is taking place. And, uh, and uh, so the, the entire of the Rift Valley, this is a geological formation uh, feature uh, cutting across the country from north to south and actually down to Tanzania uh, and, uh, and as far as north as actually all the way to Egypt. So it, it is a, geograph a big, huge geographical feature, but uh, now it has got a lot of uh, a geothermal potential in the region. And so, uh, very little has been tapped. Uh, very, very little indeed has been tapped. A lot of it is being still in the process. And the area, the specific area, focus area, has been um, in a particular area where this is just a sketch representation of, uh, of uh, how rich 
and how layered the, the specific area is as a conservation area, but also as a, as a community land uh, where like, communities are practicing their farming. Uh, and then now as a, a big development uh, project area. And uh, theoretically, I've, of course, I've been critiquing development and are coming from the background of anthropologists and anthropologists. Um, uh, I'm, I'm guided uh, by, by other development um, anthropologists, such as Escoba, that have developed a lot of interest in the contemporary development agenda. But uh, myself, have, I'm coming in as a really using engaged anthropology uh, because I want to engage all the stakeholders involved in this, but also using this, the, the anthropology of the self because I, I happen to be a Maasai and uh, so I'm looking at myself and how uh, uh, we are, I am and my community is interacting with all these changes that are happening around them. But then the model on the right hand, uh, the modern uh, form of mind layer or development is meaning moving forward. And uh, you know that being used as a prison for imagining order and progress, you know, to determine Kenya's political economic agenda. And so, you know, looking from those perspectives and then now integrating the Maasai uh, perspective uh, to try and construct the nexus between all these dynamics. And uh, therefore, looking at that Mandeleo through the Englishian lenses, I would say that Mandeleo uh, is actually a post-colonial construct of development. Um, which has come to define basically how resources are allocated nationally. And, uh, and as such, uh, this is determined by various factors uh, that, that define uh, the, the political economy of the country, uh, including ethnicity, uh, including geographical uh, uh, distribution of the, of the populations. Uh, it also includes the power dynamics of um, the, the, the people who are able to access education earlier on and those who are not that happen to be more indigenous than the others. And so there are so many factors that come into play and therefore has brought in a sort of condition for a desired uh, socioeconomic uh, threshold of a particular given entity because in the country there's a lot of divide of ethnicity and, uh, and, and tribal affiliations and uh, political affiliations. You know, there are all those uh, affiliations in the country. And so, but again, looking from the Maasai side of my, what they would perceive as Mindeleo or as, a, as development, uh, then I'm drawn to this Englishian philosophy, uh, which basically means well-being um, or, or rather maybe what could be nowadays interpreted as sustainable development, if, if that is the term that can be closer to that. Uh, but uh, this um, this has uh, this can be understood from being you know human and environment a centered concept or idea of the of the Maasai uh, that is more of, of looking into the the humanity uh, and and the environment uh, that they live in and around, but also it also promotes equity and equality across the board, and uh, it's not really it kind of deviates from the the, 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 the forces that we know today of capitalism where, you know, the, those who are disadvantaged, those who are advantaged have it all, and those who are disadvantaged lose it all. And so Englishian tend to kind of mediate that and uh, bring out a balance uh, on that end. And so, um, so using Englishian, I would want to understand how this mind level uh, has been or could be uh, be better mediated to be more of more inclined to the well-being side of the society. Um, why I'm doing that is because um, when we look at uh, the geothermal development in the country, uh, as much as it's really good in all respects, you know, it's a green energy as it were. It, it's going to uh, about development in the country by lowering the cost of energy. Um, because it's clean energy, it's probably uh, much more cheaper than the other, the other sources of energy. Uh, it's going to address the bigger global uh, 
uh, need of, or, or, or rather a challenge of, of, of global warming and climate change. So it is good in all that aspect, but you, you zoom it down to the community and we find a lot of uh, contestation about it and a lot of discomfort, a lot of suffering, uh, not only from the community side, but also from the bio or the natural environment uh, side that is also suffering as a result of these mega development projects taking place. And so um, how good it is and the extent to which it can be qualified as a good project um, is something that really requires critical analysis, uh, which I attempted to do. And um, from the Maasai uh, community and the perspective of uh, Engishon, uh, this, this, this was kind of uh, synthesized and summarized to include a really leadership as a pillar that supports the uh, a good governance, uh, that's era matare. Uh, this, these are Maasai terms. <laughs> Oringa is leadership, era uh, is good governance, as is, is about the right based approach to uh, maendeleo or that well-being that is uh, embodied in the Engishon philosophy. And so this, these three are very critical in uh, understanding Engishon. This, I would say, we could say that these are the values that, that uh, uh, define Sengisho. And But then um, when we look at that uh, against Mandeleo in that area where I did my study, uh, then you'll be, able, you'll be uh, confronted by such images uh, where you'll see wildlife coming out to the roads, displaced by such development projects in their, in their natural habitat. And uh, so, uh, no, it's normally said that photo speaks a thousand words, and uh, it, it is, it is uh, it's hard sometimes to see these uh, animals coming to the road and sometimes being killed or even themselves killing people. Uh, there's a lot of conflict that's arising, a lot of friction that's arising as a result of this destabilization. And I know this is the case in many, in many places, including the States, there are a lot of road kills on the roads. Uh, that only means that uh, uh, we have displaced uh, the, the, bio, the natural uh, members of, the, of our environment. Um, but then the, the, for them, from the Maasai social cultural perspective, uh, the Maasai have been organized structurally in a way as to be able to accommodate the ancient values or rather to advance the ancient values. And uh, the Maasai community generally is a, is a uh, organized in, in three clusters, so to speak. Olosho, Olosho is, a, these are sections that are geographically um, distinct from one another, uh, but although they are called, or they are, rather they own that particular region, it is communally owned by that particular group, but also by the whole community at large. So the, it gives way for interaction and movement and, 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 and migration of, of not only of livestock, but also of wildlife from one region to another. So it is sort of, it has ownership of land, but then again, it is no man's land in the sense that it is uh, uh, communally, but also individually owned by a specific group of people. And then all Gilata are, uh, uh, Gilata is a, is a clan that cuts across, across uh, the entire community. And uh, these are the filial relations. These are the blood relations, you know, the relatives that cut across the community and tend to bring about uh, to accommodate reciprocity, advance reciprocity in the community, accommodate the needs of the others, and uh, guide so many other social aspects of life, such as marriages and all that, and also use for conflict resolutions. And all those are also very integral in maintaining a harmony in the community and advancing the engagement values. And then the age groups, the old poor are age groups and age sets. Uh, is how they are organized, the community is organized, uh, uh, you would say horizontally in terms of age groups that are also like political uh, uh, institutions of the community. They are leaders, the chiefs for each and every old poro that always comes and get initiated through a rite of passage, through uh, ceremonies, as you would say in that photo, and then, uh, you know, uh, transition to uh, subsequent rights of passages and, 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 and responsibilities as they accommodate another one that is coming up. So it is seamless. 
it is organized way of taking over and managing uh, power dynamics in the society, in the community. Uh, but then when you, that, that, that traditional social organization has been uh, now currently in the community has been uh, uh, so much kind of interfered with by the other incoming power dynamics, the institutions are kind of in a way upset at the power dynamics in the community, including religious institutions, Christianity in this community, and then the political uh, uh, leadership that is now currently also strongly there since the time of independence. And so there is a now kind of a mix up in the community. And this has influenced the intuition, or rather, has affected the way they would guide the intuition to the direction that they would, they would want it to go. And in that region, you will see that uh, confusion even coming out uh, in terms of uh, uh, indigeneity and modernity of, of Mindeleo. Uh, like where the, the geothermal is taking place, we will see still livestock uh, uh, rearing taking place, um, grazing of livestock in the region, but then uh, under the, the, the big uh, infrastructural uh, a good uh, infrastructure there, you'll see the power lines, you'll see the pipelines, and then there's a national park on the other side, there's an energy park there, uh, but then there's uh, sheep grazing there. So it is really a cocktail of uh, competition of land use. And so uh, all this is bound to bring a lot of frictions and impacting on the imbalances that are there. And uh, what has happened in the region uh, is a lot of uh, uh, forceful evictions of the communities uh, by the state, by the, the state and the investors. This has happened in that region um, where they would want to extract the geothermal power, uh, but mediation in some areas have been used. In some areas, forceful eviction has, has been used. And we have seen bulldozers coming to flatten the houses in some areas. Conflicts are incited and homes are banned just to make people move out and give way to the so-called development. And so this begs the question whether, whether this is really development or is a kind of a reverse sort of development. Um, but what I've been uh, advocating uh, and that's coming out of my, uh, my studies uh, is trying to mediate uh, ambition and uh, try to construct the nexus, but from within the Maasai uh, context, uh, the Maasai perspective, how they will mediate um, uh, the, their traditional organization on one hand, that is the Olosho, Olgelata, Olporo, in the midst of the contemporary uh, leadership structures, because all this actually, the leadership that it, it is the driving is kind of the drivers of development or mind and layer, whether it is positive or negative, it really falls on the, on the roles of, of, of leadership, whether it is traditional leadership, political leadership, or religious leadership. And so uh, how that can be mediated, the, the nexus between the three, uh, but of course also mediating the, the values of engagement as it were, uh, that is a uh, good governance, the leadership, and the rights of the people will probably uh, bring an ideal well-being. And that's the intuition, the desired goal of, uh, of, the, of the community. That's how they would want to be in the, in the future. Uh, it, it is, that's why I said this is an engagement apology from my end, because it trying to influence the mindset and the thinking of, uh, of these different groups uh, and, uh, uh, that, that are so ideologically so distanced, you know, like the traditional, uh, which is still a very strong uh, pillar in the community and still practicing a lot of traditional um, kind of governance systems, have their traditional uh, leaders, uh, traditional way of doing things, the ceremonies, rites of passages, but also the political group drawn from the Maasai community, yes, from the region of representatives, but also, but with a lot of influence from the national leadership and international forces. And uh, that tends always to be um, in conflict with the, with the traditional, you know, and the church that uh, kind of aloof from the other two, I mean, the, the, the religious group, 
uh, tend to look at the traditional and the political not as good guys. <laughs> but, uh, but again, with, it also has a very heavy representation of the, of the community uh, that, are, that are both traditional and religious in terms of Christianity and, and political. And so unless this is mediated within the community, it would be hard for them to be able to redefine shown as it were in the current context and be able to engage with the national political economic agenda and the international development agenda, uh, such as uh, the, uh, the geothermal actors, because even the geothermal development that is taking place, I'm just using geothermal as an example, but there's a lot of other resource development uh, extractions taking place in the, in not only the Maasai community, but in the other indigenous people's communities, other pastoralist areas in the country, uh, you know, extracting different types of resources. Um, there's even there a lot of wind power in other regions, there's even oil exploration in other areas, there's a, a lot of um, uh, these other minerals, uh, gold mining and in some areas. And so Jodama is just a, a case study in this matter, but this is a replica of what is happening elsewhere uh, in the region. And so um, this is very critical not only for the Maasai, but for every other community that, that is, that is that is um, uh, thinking around the three uh, forces around them, the political, traditional, and religious forces around them. And, um, and therefore, um, as I bring this to a close, as to allow time for maybe uh, questions and interactions, uh, I would say that uh, the Masa in particular have interacted with the the history of development and uh, from the times of the colonial, um, you know, first coming about a hundred or so years ago um, into, into the Maasai territory and uh, having so many areas, you know, experienced or rather made to adopt the development as, as it is uh, advanced by the colonial uh, people who are settling in the country and particularly in their region. To, kind of abandon uh, pastoralism, adopt ranching, uh, go to the formal schools, um, you know, or take up all that could be defined as modern development, so to speak. And uh, in so many cases, uh, at least from the Maasai point of view, they kind of rejected that for so long and um, uh, used that as a defense mechanism, you know, to kind of close in and reject that what comes from outside. Uh, this is one of the reasons that, that would be used to define why the mass are still perceived as more uh, cultural, more traditional, compared to other communities that accepted the so-called development uh, and moved on. And, um, and as such, the, the, the loss of uh, strategic alliances building opportunities in this case, I mean, uh, uh, because of that kind of isolation, they could not be able to engage uh, with the national agenda in the political realm. And that has further continued to uh, relegate them further, marginalize them further from benefiting from the national resources, the sharing of national resources, uh, because politically they could not uh, meaningfully engage and build on strategic alliances to be able to mediate for allocation of resources. And that has led to the loss of engagement defenses uh, such as a leadership, um, uh, ability to uh, govern themselves and sort of lost their rights, uh, rights to development and reduced the resilience and further exacerbated uh, vulnerability. And uh, so um, the development as it is even currently uh, with the geothermal in the, in the area, uh, and other mega development projects uh, from the Maasai point of view, it is further marginalizing them and they are not benefiting from the good part of it, of, of development, because uh, some of the areas that, that were pointed, that have been always been pointed out as reason for vulnerability is the loss of land. As we have seen earlier, they have been pushed out of their grazing areas, pushed out of their, of their habitats and as well as the wildlife. Uh, and, uh, and and not benefited from the employment opportunities and even the resource itself. Because if you could uh, have zoomed in too closely on those power lines, they going over overhead their 
their homes and uh, you know being evacuated to to the cities for for distribution and so they are not benefiting from the resource as it is and therefore um that 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 make, makes them say that this is not a good development it's not really development as to the meaning and the, the deeper uh, it doesn't make sense to the deeper uh, latter of the word of, of development as it is and so Mendeleev, therefore, in that case, needs to be mediated in you know, order to try and bring it in con to conformity with the as, uh, as understood by the communities. Uh, but to do that uh, requires a lot of mediation, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, deeper engagement with the communities, uh, uh, which is currently happening a lot of civic education, a lot of civic uh, awareness, on, on how best they can be able to mobilize uh, their values and be able to engage with these forces that are coming from uh, 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 from outside. And uh, in conclusion, um, there is a lot of uh, assemblages of institutions and a lot of coalitions happening and nationally. You know, like investments companies investing on these resources uh, nationally, but also internationally. We see. Uh, the financing by financing by uh, uh, international uh, monetary organizations and bilateral institutions such as the World Bank, uh, being funded by the European Development Bank, uh, and so there are so many institutions that are coming together, coalition, and uh, also local institutions and governments forming an assemblage of institutions that communities are. Are, find it very difficult to engage and very difficult to, to resist, uh, forcing them to sometimes being resettled uh, or being forced in the terms of those who are doing so. And so uh, resettlement requires really a lot of mediation and uh, mediation only for consent of moving, but also mediation for benefit sharing that are coming out of those resources. Those are the desired um, you know, that's what's decided maybe uh, to be done in such communities. Hard to come by, but uh, it practically, it's difficult, but uh, it's really a desire. Um, there are sometimes enabling environment by, by policies, by uh, either by these financing institutions or by even by the government itself on paper. But sometimes when it comes to doing it practically on the ground, uh, it becomes quite difficult. To, to, to make it work as, as it were. And so uh, the communities are still losing, even when we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of beautiful um, uh, social safeguard policies, benefit sharing policies, uh, but it doesn't really translate to what is on paper in, in terms of the pra practically what comes down to the communities. And then advocacy and litigation and protest movements, of course, this has had, uh, it's very common in the indigenous uh, fraternity currently all over the globe, uh, and also happening in the Maasai. These movements are all over, both locally, nationally, regionally, and internationally through the UN systems, the indigenous peoples networks. Uh, but of course, also it comes with the, with the limitations because uh, of, of, of uh, the, the information, the knowledge, the costs of being such litigation. And so most of the time they tend to lose. This has also happened in the same region that uh, has been under study in this particular study. Uh, and a, a series of court cases from one court to another, uh, a lot of legal jargon and that has always confused them and you know, make them lose continually. And so it becomes another very tricky way of engaging uh, the adversaries. And therefore uh, this, the nexus is a uh, development conservation and the livelihoods nexus really need to be crafted very well uh, if the ambition is to be realized in the future. Uh, the, on, on the spe specifically on the issues of governance, especially of the environment, uh, what has come out very clearly is that uh, in, in the country, for example, like Kenya that cherishes uh, natural environment, conservation, 
and the country is really depended or dependent on, on, on tourism, on wildlife conservation. Uh, but uh, then the question is, why are we doing conservation? Is it for posterity or we're just doing for convenience? And then when uh, uh, another project that comes in that is much more rewarding in terms of money, we tend to give in you know, as a country. And so there's a lot of uh, disruption by the mega development projects a lot of the disruption of, 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 of conservation, of uh, well-being of these communities, um, just because these projects are more lucrative than maybe conservation as it were. And therefore, conservation is, we can comfortably say that it is universally proportional to mega development in a particular given space. Because why? Because the government privileges mega development sometimes over conservation due, due to economic premium, as I have said, that uh, if, uh, for example, Geodamo is going to rake in a lot of dollars, then uh, the, 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 the government would kind of sacrifice uh, conservation uh, in the interest of, uh, of this development of these projects. Uh, but for the communities, they would prefer to, 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 to have conservation in their spaces, to practice their traditional way of life, their, their culture, uh, as opposed to this mega development projects. Why? Because as I said earlier, they don't see really the immediate benefits to themselves. It might come down indirectly as a national uh, spillover, but uh, as it were, they see it as an inconvenience. They see it as a, another way where they, they, they are losing much more resources, especially land. And so to the communities, they would rather prefer not to uh, embrace such development, such Mandeleo, as it were, uh, but rather have, if they are going to have Mandeleo, then it's Mandeleo that, that, that they'll be able to push uh, from their end in a way that can favor them. And so that is all I have this evening. I'd uh, like to share about uh, my experience and in engaging in this very interesting topic of, of, uh, of One Health, which uh, I think uh, my study uh, tend to contribute towards that goal of, uh, of having uh, an environment that is, that is safe, that is good, to, to all members of the society, to all members of this of, of our global uh, uh, village, so to speak, that both the wildlife, both the people, the way they do things, uh, uh, their way of life, their cultures, or their values, and that is what we will define as as inkshon. So inkshon can as well be uh, translated as one health because that's actually what it is. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Doctor Doctor Roge. Um, what I'll do is while while people begin to uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll read the questions that that um, our participants are asking, um, and as they begin to fill out the questions, I, I do have a question for you. Um, in in your talk, you talked about particular vulnerable communities, especially those communities that um, maybe are sticking to their traditions a bit more. And you talked about Elosho, the geographical structure, the clan structure of of um, territories of, I don't know, land ownership. Um, in thinking about Enkishon, how does that reconcile kind of with modern understandings of land ownership driven by a capitalist society? I mean, is there a way of reconciling um, maybe traditional understandings of land territories and ownership with modern understandings of land ownership and private property? that I assume might be driven by the national government. Um, and, and does this, you know, where do communities stand in this? I know in, 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 my, in my research in, in Latin America, when it comes to particular um, natural resources, even when indigenous communities have adopted a more modern, under, a more modern practice of land ownership, the national government still owns the subsoil, so to speak. So it doesn't necessarily give them a leg up when when trying to combat some some of the forces of of development um, as defined by the national government. So how does it, what does this look like in in Kenya? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the issue of uh, land. Um... It's really a very emotive issue and uh, and a sensitive one. 
for that matter in Kenya, uh, especially where I did my research and the community that I interacted with, because that area have a, have a lot of historical, the continuity of the historical um, injustices emanating from the land uh, that in the, in the early, the early um, 1900s, you know, yeah, around, around that time, uh, like a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. this, this particular community was uh, duped into signing uh, anglo Maasai agreements and they ceded a lot of land uh, to the British settlers to settle there and form what was called the White uh, Highlands to do their farming. And so this particular area where now Jodamon is taking place is an extension of that territory that is covered by the agreements. And, uh, but uh, after independence, they, the communities, the, 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 the white settlers moved away, but those who took over are those, the, the elites of the political elites of that, of the, of that time, uh, the, 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 the Africans who were able to interact with the colonial, they were able to, take, to capture the political power of their country. And so the land ownership changed hands not from the, from the white settlers to the, to the indigenous Africans, but not really the indigenous owners of the land, not the Maasai, but the Maasai were occupying the, they could, after the, the white settlers moved out, these Maasai moved in to occupy the land. And so there've always been a lot of contestation because uh, you know, they are occupying the land. So culturally and customarily, and by history and by what is called adverse possession, they are that land belong to them. But on paper, they don't own that they don't own the land. So the investors are dealing in, in Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya, with the legal owners of the land who are holding papers. But on the ground, these the masses are considered as illegal settlers. I mean, like yeah, it's called locally as squatters, they are squatting there, <laughs> they are not mm -hmm. permanently settled. And so that is one layer of uh, land contestation. But just um, briefly to uh, rope in the, uh, the, the Englishian philosophy and the issue of land uh, ownership. Uh, I think what has been happening is to try to dismantle the commons. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with the, with the colonialists and uh, it's moving on, it's being implemented by the, the, the independent uh, governments. Uh, trying to dismantle the common source to make it more appealing to investments and to investors to come in and also to be able to facilitate even the commercialization of land. So even the selling of land, uh, because now it is privatized, you own that it will lead, you can sell it if you want. And so it has reduced decision making from the communal space to an individual who can now just decide what to do. And this is affecting the ingestion of the rest because ingestion only works if it is tied to the interests of the neighbor or the other parts of the, of the or poror, of, or locho, all those institutions that I was talking about. But this is actually now being upset by, by the change of land tenure. So it is really making ingestion very, very complicated, right. but, uh, the community in communities in different areas are trying to go around that by actually reversing the individual ownership of land, kind of amalgamating again their individual puzzles from conservancies in other areas for conservation purposes. Uh, you know, refuse to fence uh, or or to own individually, but still own it as a as a clan, as a as a law show. It's happening in some areas, but in so many other areas that are, are unable to go around the intricacies of, of uh, the change of land tenure. So it's really a very complex issue. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, here's, a, here's a question from Dana. Um, Community-based con con conservation is a field I would love to work in one day. How do you handle challenges with your community when they conflict with your conservation efforts? Come again with the question. Um, Community-based conservation is the field I would love to work in one day. How do you handle challenges with your community when they conflict with your conservation efforts? Uh, the communities have handled this in different ways um, because uh, conflicts are arising from different from different source uh, uh, quarters and from for different reasons. Uh, because one of the major drivers of sometimes of conflicts over conservation is, uh, 
the, the, the partnership, so to speak, of, uh, of, of conservation. Because the communities own the land, uh, but for ecotourism to work, because the, 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 the idea, the whole idea driving community-based conservation is so that conservation can pay, can be an incentive to the community so that communities can economically benefit from the wildlife being in their land and hopefully continue keeping them, uh, which I critique from in, in my study because uh, the mass I had preserved wildlife for generations without any economic incentive. They did it for other reasons. They did it because they have an, an intimate relationship. They have like a very close relationship with them uh, in so many areas in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in not because they don't hunt, they don't eat them, but uh, they, they kind of identify with them and various clans have adopted and have several, uh, you know, like they own, so to speak, like giraffes belong to our clans, hyenas belong to that and that class. So it's kind of that belonging and that ownership that uh, has kind of, yes, they are wild, but in a sense, they are kind of domesticated, so to speak. But uh, now this whole concept of introducing, of commercializing conservation, uh, he's, ha, has also caused a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, conflict. One, because you will never pay enough of hosting those wildlife in, the, in those spaces, in those communities. The wildlife kill the people, they kill the livestock. So if it is, if it is not being maintained for cultural reasons, there's those that values that are not quantifiable in terms of monetary terms. If we reduce that into dollars, then it reduces the whole concept of, uh, of, of conservation. Uh, that's one. And then number two, the partnership of the investors and the communities, the investors comes and put up lodges, put up hotels, and um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then pay the, the members of that particular community from the revenue. But uh, there've always been a lot of conflict around that because of lack of transparency. The communities think that may, perhaps the investor is making more money. Uh, there are also sometimes the restrictions of, of uh, you know, these, the, 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 the agreements that are done between the investor and the community. And most of the times these agreements are not honored uh, because the, 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 the livestock are not required to graze in specific areas. And these specific areas are the critical areas that, uh, that their livestock would really need to survive bad times of drought. And so that brings in a lot of conflict. And so these conflicts uh, emanates from, for, you know, from different quarters and for different reasons. Um, and sometimes it, they have been resolved amicably and sometimes in some areas they are not. In other, in other areas they couldn't actually. And it, they, sometimes it has even got to the extent of uh, bad conflict, like even touching of, uh, of these ecologies I've seen in some areas, communities waking up and, and destroying the ecologies and closing in the ecosystem. So uh, it is another area of, of conflict. And uh, in Kishon is, is um, yes, it is applicable, but the whole new concept, this is a new concept, the CBC is a new concept, community building service is really a very new concept in the community. And so it's taking, and it's being driven sometimes by the elites of the communities. So there's also the elite capture of it. And so even the, the rest of the communities feel like they are being uh, the gatekeepers of the community are like probably duping them. So there are so many layers of mistrust and, and, and conflict, which is a very big issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably that requires another whole <laughs> day for, for a lecture on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, here's a question from Claire. You mentioned an economic premium for mega development do local communities benefit from these development projects, such as through jobs or energy? Who exactly is benefiting from these? Do the local people get any say in this or no? Thank you. Um, the, 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 the main reason of uh, this content is, uh, is, is the fact that they are not benefiting from this resource. Uh, directly. Uh, most of them don't get the jobs there. One, because in such communities where these development projects are taking place, they the education level sometimes tends to be low. 
And so some of the, most of the community members do not have the requisite skills to be employed in those areas. And even when they are there, there's still a lot of uh, political interest from outside. You know, the other dominant communities uh, that are politically connected uh, somehow just gets maneuver their way through because there's a law in Kenya that uh, requires that such projects should employ at least 30% of the local people. I mean, their employment, their workforce should comprise of 30% of the local people. But uh, uh, recent audits of so many projects shows that, that doesn't, that's not the case. But then also there's a core question of who is local because the law is very vague on who is local <laughs> because anyone can, can qualify himself, herself that I am local because uh, maybe I live around that area, but you are not necessarily the bona fide indigenous person of that particular community. Uh, so the, there is a contestation of, of, of who is local and even of indigeneity, even where maybe the term indigenous is sometimes used as a tool for negotiation for some of these benefits. Uh, it's also very much contested, especially in Kenya, uh, because everybody can say we are also indigenous. You know? so, uh, uh, so, so in terms of benefits, uh, especially in terms of employment, is, is really an issue. And uh, benefiting from the resource itself, like the power, uh, it's not in most of the places that, uh, and especially the area where I have, I've worked, I've done this particular study, uh, many, many, many households do not have electricity. And even those, the few that have uh, some areas that are connected, they find it very hard to afford to pay at the end of the month, to pay the rates that are required to pay. And so uh, the, it's a big resource coming out of their land. And some of them are at times saying, we should be given this power for free because we have contributed, we have donated the land, or rather the land was taken from us. Uh, but that's not the case because of so many stakeholders involved, you know, those who are exploring to those who are bringing this steam to the, to the, to the, to the, to the subservice, those converting into power, those who have a painting and another, another whole entity that is now going to market the percent, the, the energy uh, to the mm -hmm. consumers. And so it's very difficult to, for them to engage because of the so many bureaucracies that are involved. So in terms of benefits, we can just wrap up that one. Uh, it's a big, very big issue. Uh, and actually that's a major force of conflict because they say we don't benefit from such resources. So as a follow-up question, do you, in, in your research, have you found any community that has maybe been able to directly negotiate Are there, with, with some of these external companies coming in to exploit um, this natural resource or the, the geothermal power have, are there any communities that have been able to do this? Or is uh, it people in Nairobi that are, that are um, negotiating with these companies or investors? There is one, there's one section of the community in the area that I worked in that have, uh, that have attempted to negotiate Mm -hmm. uh, with the with the Ken, Kenya Kenya generating company is uh, is one of the companies that is developing geothermal in the region among other companies, but uh, Kenya is partly private and partly public company, okay. and uh, the community a section of the government tried to engage them, uh, and so they were moved, kind of resettled, uh, in another location, so they agreed to do. Uh, they agreed to do um, land for land kind of compensation, like give us another land. We don't want money as such. Give us land, uh, but then they build houses for the households, identified about 150 households, build the houses for them in an alternative land. And uh, uh, so many other pledges were involved in the, in the agreement that they did with them, uh, including supply of water, building of roads networks and opening up that new village to a road to accessibility. Um, but uh, uh, what happened down the line is that after they have moved, then they realize that, hey, this is a lot of the, of the promises that were made were not fulfilled, like one, two, three years down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, the 
area they went in was much inferior in terms of quality from the area that they came from. And the construction of the villages didn't conform to the cultural norms and requirements of this particular community. So it's kind of also affected a lot in the social cultural end. And so there were a lot of many other problems that came out of that, that they, that they on the basis of their negotiation, they petitioned the financier, that's the World Bank. Uh, they did a, a petition to them. And then there was a team that came to mediate between the community and that, and that particular company uh, to be able to fulfill their promises. So that one attempted to engage, but uh, you see the power relations are, are so, you know, are so diverse, so didn't work as such. So one other community recently in another area is trying to establish a geothermal company by itself so that they can go out and look for investors to come and invest in their land and be able to directly benefit from this particular resource. But then they have a very big challenge going around the government requirements. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the requirements of the Ministry of Mining and all the other ministries involved uh, uh, because they didn't anticipate such communities can be able to uh, front such kind of a, a proposal. So uh, there's still a lot of challenges. Yes, there might be room for engagement and negotiation, but there's a lot of hurdles to be overcome. Okay. Um. Well, we are we are at time. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, thank Welcome. you to all of you who have attended today. We greatly appreciate you being here. Uh, if you are a community member and you would like to hear about One Health events that are coming up in the future and would like to receive emails, just drop me an email at reg, R-E-G, dot Hoyt, H-O-Y-T, at delval.edu. And I'd also like to remind everybody that the library at Delval has a whole host of resources about One Health and maybe some things that will uh, help you understand this, this presentation today at greater depth as well. And uh, utilize those resources at library.delval.edu forward slash One Health, one word. Dr. Casas, thank you so much for moderating the session today. And Dr. Sol uh, Solal Roger, many, many thanks. I look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to give us an update sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Okay. Greatly Bye. appreciated you joining us from, from all the way from Kenya. We appreciate it. You are most welcome. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Take, take care, everybody. Bye. Have a great